Can we all say amen? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you in praise, worship, adoration. And I know that most weeks I ask to have your presence felt by each one here. But the truth is that you are in each one of us who have accepted your salvation and your lordship. We need to never forget that you're there. We just need to seek you. Lord, we ask you to bless this country as you have for many years. We ask you to prick the hearts of the leaders in all capacities that they may seek your wisdom and discernment as they rule. We ask you to be with our military, our firemen, our policemen, our EMTs, and their families. They do their best to keep us free. And freedom isn't free. Someone pays. Lord, be with all of those Pastor Eddie has lifted up and all of those listed in our bulletin. You know exactly what each one of them needs. And I know you're taking care of it in your time and in your way. We also know that you know which, what each one of us needs better than we do ourselves. May we continue to grow and be more like your son so that others can see us and know there's a difference. Be with each one here. Truly bless each one of us. And Lord, you know what we need. You know what this church needs. And you know what the global church needs. Be with us. Surround us. Give us your peace, your grace, and your love. And Lord, we lift to you all our silent prayers at this time. We ask all of this in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Word. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said, replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Now, I mentioned that the passage that Bonnie read to us a few moments ago is a diving board. 
And I'm going to have a lot of fun uh, at the 930 service with the children's story. I actually told that it's superior this last week. Uh, using the Good Samaritan story, relating it to the critters. So if you're not in Sunday school and you want to stick around a few minutes, you're more than welcome to hear that in the 930 service. But the passage of Scripture, the lectionary, actually includes that entire story. So I would encourage you this week, uh, if you're following along with us, that you read through that, uh, especially after I touch on the concepts of this story that Jesus uh, tells us, and we've called it the Good Samaritan story. Jesus didn't necessarily call him uh, the Good Samaritan. He just calls him a Samaritan. But we know by the response to the need that was in front of him, we have put together that he was a good individual and that we are to follow suit. Now, in the United States, the concept of Good Samaritan is, is common. Most people know that term and they know what it means. I was in Walmart last night and I saw one of the members of our church that is a, a police officer and I was asking him because Miss Debbie said she had talked to him about uh, this Good Samaritan law that we're kind of under as in the United States. In other words, and you're probably familiar with this, that if something happens somewhere and you're trying to help out and let's say what you do ends up not helping, maybe go in the opposite direction accidentally, that there is a good Samaritan, you know, in quotation, law that you fall under if the intent was good. Now, the officer, it's Lee Whitson. Many of you know Lee. Uh, Lee told me, he said, but it works the other way as well. He said that if you see something happening and somebody's being hurt and you don't do anything about it, he said there is the possibility that they can use that Good Samaritan concept to uh, show your liability, that you just didn't do anything. You know, we live in a day and age where people, uh, when they see something that's crazy or something, they'll pull out their phones, right? And they try to film it or something. And that's terrible to do if somebody needs your help, and instead you're trying to film them and uh, hoping that it'll go viral on Facebook or something like that. So he said it works both ways. Now, the idea of the Good Samaritan concept is that it's based on the Bible. And once again, that shows us as American citizens that our founding fathers, the principles that we live under, are based on the Bible. Can you say amen? I mean, that's just as clear as mud in that concept. Now, many of us have probably practiced the Good Samaritan spirit. Now, the other day, I had the opportunity and I, I missed it. I was riding downtown. I was going to uh, the hospital, I think, over in Seven Rivers and Crystal River, and I saw McKay Drake. Many of you know McKay. He's a member of our church, and he had his hood up. And I saw that, and I thought, well, I started praying for him, and I saw him on his phone, and I uh, started making a turn. Now, I'm not the best mechanic in the world, and most people, when they see me come and put the hood down, you know, and, but I thought, you know, there's McKay, and I've got to help him and do whatever I can. So I pulled up there, and I said, what can we do? And he said he had a man already coming with jumper cables, and uh, so I don't know if he was trying to get rid of me. You know, <laughs> I didn't want me to mess up his car, you know, and he was so gracious. What I missed was I said, okay, you know, and, and you let us know you got my cell if, you, if anything happens. And I took off to go to the hospital. What I should have done is said, Mr. Drake, uh, you know what? You're hot and, uh, and probably hungry out here. It's not my fried day, but just for you, I'll go up and get us a bucket of fried chicken and we'll sit here and wait on those jumper cables. Somebody say amen. See, so I miss that Good Samaritan <laughs> opportunity there. When we see a need, you know, we're to meet that need. It's a biblical standard. It's a teaching of Jesus Christ. And many times... To be honest with you, we fail. We, we don't hit that. We don't, we, we're too busy in our own lives. So this story is, is not so much about doing the right thing, but in the idea of who to do the right thing to. All right? Stay with me. The A of our ABCs. The uh, leader in the story is talking to Jesus, and he asks, what is the greatest commandment? What must I do to inherit eternal life. That'll be the A of our ABCs this morning in, in uh, my, the sermon the Lord has laid on my heart. He asked the Lord. We've said that many times from this, this chancel, that when you're struggling or seeking the Lord, I mentioned that in the Stephen ministry concept, you know, ask. The Bible tells us to ask. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. 
And remember the story of Mary and Martha. When Martha was struggling with her sister, she went to Jesus to ask him to do something. Dear friends, we are called upon as Christians to ask of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls us to seek in the world those that we might bless those that we might pass on the peace of God to. We do that far away, and I mentioned in Cuba a few moments ago, in Africa and Honduras, other parts of the world, and we do that locally as well. Right here with Habitat for Humanity, uh, Happy Feet, the Backpack Ministry, a zillion others, Vacation Bible School. We are seeking ways to be good Samaritans, to share the love of God, to build the kingdom in everything that we do. And that should be when we wake up in the morning on our mind, Lord, what can I do to bless someone else? Can you open the doors that I can touch someone's life, that I can be a blessing to someone else because you have blessed me so much? Now, sometimes doing that, our hands get a little dirty. Sometimes our reputation can even be soiled. You see, Jesus would minister to folks, even folks that were the downcast and the outsiders, and others would say, why is he doing that? One of the stories of Jesus, you'll remember well, is that he steps into a, a gentleman's house. And remember that because of the, the, the agrarian society, the day and age of Jesus, people in sandals, those that had sandals, walking great distances, that when you came into a house, the proper procedure there was uh, is to have your feet washed and, you know, to cleanse you that coolness. I mean, that was just a nice thing. I remember my sister when she had a pool that when we would be in the pool and then come into the house, there was always a bucket of water. Some of you may do the, have the same thing. You stepped in and it cooled your feet off, cleaned your feet, and then you stepped into the house. A lot of people, they take their shoes off before you go into the house. That's their tradition. It's just a, a concept there. Well, Jesus is in this house, and this woman is right there at the gate, of course. And she is kind of the parlor, you know, going into the house. So other people could be there, maybe like a porch type scene. And she is just crying and weeping, if you remember the story. And she's, she's washing Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, the owner of the house, if you remember that story, is looking there saying, well, if this was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is washing his feet. And he'd just kick her out of the way. But Jesus does know what kind of woman is washing his feet. Do you remember the story? So he tells him a story. And talks about somebody that has great needs and crying out to God. Then they have great love. And he said, you've not even offered me a bucket of water to step into to cool my feet off. And from the moment I've been here, she has been uh, cleaning my feet with her tears. Jesus makes it very clear who we need to minister to. And who the neighbors are that we are to reach out to and to love and to care for. The B of our ABCs today is the actual story. A man, Jesus said, is beaten. That'll be the B of our ABCs. The A is that we are to ask. That's what the leader is. Asking Jesus what should happen here in his relationship with God to have eternal life. And so Jesus tells him a story and he says, a man was beaten on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, from Jerusalem on down to Jericho, Jerusalem was up high, is up high, and so everything is down. And so that was a dangerous road. And so it, when Jesus is telling this story, everybody knows that. And there are people there that will trick you. There's people there that will act like they're hurt, hoping that you will come and then they will steal and beat you up. Now, Jesus said there's a man that is beaten that is there. And the first one that comes by, of course, is the priest. Now, he comes by, he sees the need, and he walks by on the other side. He's busy. He's going to church. He's doing godly kind of things. And according to the law of the Old Testament, they were not to touch anything that had the blood or unclean or a person like that. That was their concept of being sacred and holy and living for God. That's what they believe. And so really, the, the, the priest is, is moving on the other side, is doing what he thinks his Holy Bible tells him to do. Now, isn't that scary? That's what he believes his Holy Bible is telling him to do. There's so many people in this day and age that will tell me that they're following the Holy Bible, and I'm thinking, are they reading the same book that I'm reading? Anybody ever have that question? Are you reading the same Bible that I'm reading? You, you say that? Well, that's just what was going on in this story. And then the second one, let's not just blame the preachers here now. The Sunday school teacher comes by. 
the Levite, the ones that were to, to take care of the church is, or the, the, the temple at that time or the synagogues. So the, he comes by and what does he do? According to the story, this beaten man over there, he passes by on the other side as well. And then Jesus tells us, of course, the Samaritan uh, comes by. Dear friends, in, in God's world, what we need is conversion. And not only conversion, we need assurance of that conversion. I was reading again two nights ago, John Wesley's journals. I've been telling you the last few months. I know you're probably bored with that. But I've got like these, these 15 journals of Mr. Wesley, our founder, hundreds of years old. old. Of course, they're, they've rewritten all of his words. And, and I was reading about his, his statement of conversion. And back, this is before his Aldersgate experience. And he said, I have a measure of faith. You know, he, and he's, he was visiting all the different churches. And he was over in Germany is actually where he is. He just went to Dresden. My son was over there recently. So it really caught my eye when I was reading that. And he said that he was moving along, talking to people like Peter Bowler, if you know the history of the church. He said, I'm looking for assurance. He said, and I don't have it yet. He said, I don't have that joy. That comes when I have that assurance. He said, but I know it's coming. He said, because I have a measure of faith. In other words, he said, I know I'm saved. And I'm reading that right there. This is our founding uh, man of the Methodist movement here. You know, he said, I know, I know it's coming, that, that second work of grace, that, that power of God. He said, I, in other words, I know that if I died, I would go to heaven. Uh, you know, I think I will at least. He said, but there is something more. And I want to tell you, church, there's something more. We need not only conversion to know that Jesus died for our sins. We need the assurance. You need to know that you know that you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven. Not by anything that you've done, but by the amazing grace of God. And when conversion takes place, our lives and other people's lives are transformed. Transformed. It changes our motivation. In 2 Kings chapter 5, I love the story of Naaman being healed by following the principles of the prophet Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 5. And so after he has followed suit and his leprosy is, is removed, he's been healed, he comes back to the prophet. He said, I want to give you something. The prophet said, no, this was a gift from God. Just go home. Can you imagine him sharing the word of God back in Syria where he went back? That must have been amazing in itself. But then he looks at Elisha. And many times we miss this in this part of the story. He said, you know... He said, I am a servant as well under a master. And he said, and when I get home, my master, when the time comes, has to go into the temple of his God. And I know it's not a God. And I know it now. I didn't know that before, but I know it now because he's had a conversion experience. He said, but he has to lean on me and he is to kneel in that idol temple. And I have to kneel with him because he has to kneel on my shoulder. He said, is that going to be all right? And look at his heart has changed. Before that, he could care less about that. He was just doing what he's supposed to do. But now he knows that God is the God of the world, the creator, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. So he's asking the prophet, he said, please understand, my heart's not there. But I don't know what else to do right now. I don't know what else to do. And the prophet, just in grace, representing Jesus, just looks at him and said, it's okay. That's going to be okay. Your heart is with God. God will work that out. We don't know what all went on after that. That's the end of that story. But his, his motivation is changed. When somebody is converted, they have a different way of looking at things. They have a different way of seeing things. And so Jesus, when he's telling us about this Good Samaritan story, he's saying that when God gets a hold of you, you begin to see things. You begin to see people that you didn't necessarily like before in a whole new light. And if you're saying right now, Brother Eddie, I don't, I don't know, I don't think that's happened to me, then you need to be converted. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you know? I mean, I'm dealing with our feelings, emotions, the way we were raised, all of us struggle with that. But there needs to be a voice, a motivation inside of you that says, you know what? What's the Bible say about that? What's going on there? What's, what's, why do you feel that way? Why are you acting that way? Why are you so angry? Why, why do you not like this individual or this situation? What's going on? The Holy Spirit needs to grab hold of us and fill us and excite us to be good Samaritans. Can you say amen? I better move on to C or I'm going to start preaching, okay? So let me go on to C. The C of our ABCs is that the Samaritan comes along. Now, in my children's story, it's squirrely red. 
Because he's in the world of brown squirrels and gray squirrels, and nobody really cares for a different red-looking squirrel. And that he meets the need in the children's story. This is a Samaritan that nobody likes. Nobody likes. And Jesus, he, he knows his crowd. He's talking to people that don't like the Samaritans. They were the half-breeds. Many of you already know this. We've, we've shared this story many times. Remember that over Israel's history, they had been moved in and out. Uh, that's why uh, different kingdoms would, would destroy other communities. They would, they would take you into exile and they would blend you with their people or blend you with other peoples. And that would destroy your community. That would destroy your family. That would destroy your religion. Destroy everything. And so the half-breeds that developed... Because of that, over the many, many years from Samaria and Israel, they were called the Samaritans. And so the true Israelites, the pure bloods, they didn't like them. You know, they didn't like them. I had a lady one time tell me, she said, I just be- wish everybody was so intermingled and, and, you know, and we were all the same color and then everybody would get along. I said, that wouldn't happen. I wouldn't. It's one of our missionaries from the state of Florida. I said, that wouldn't happen. I said, we'd then look at each other's color of each other's eyes. Oh, you're one of them green hazel people, aren't you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm more of the darker brown color myself, you know? That's just human nature, and we might as well admit it, and we have to deal with it. Everybody's different, you see. So the Samaritans were not looked upon favorably. Remember again, I told you the key of this story is not doing good. Everybody knew that. It's who you do good to. Who you do good to, you see. And so the scripture says the Samaritan came along and cared. That'll be the C of our ABCs and the motivation for the sermon's closure today. He cared for the person that was broken. He took a chance. A person could be tricking him, but it looked pretty obvious. You know, there's a difference between somebody on the side of the road with a sign, you know, uh, to help them, which we see that all around us, and somebody that's laying half on the road and Half off the road. I mean, if you just pass by and don't at least call the police, if somebody just lay in there and somebody's going to run over them, you see what I mean? There's a big difference here of what's actually going on. And so the Samaritan sees this and says, well, this, this, I just got to do something. Got to do something in this situation, you see. I've, I've, I've got to minister. I've got to, I've got to care for this individual. And that's exactly what the Samaritan does. And he not only cares for him, takes him into the community and leaves to Denari with the innkeeper and says, if that's not enough, when I come back through, so obviously he was passing through Jericho and Jerusalem on a regular basis as a business person. He said, you, you know my account and you can charge, you can charge me, you know, I'll, I'll take care of it. And the guy knew that or he wouldn't have taken it, you see. So when Jesus is, is Answering the man when he says, you know, he said, uh, Lord, he says, who's my neighbor? You remember that? Who, who's my neighbor? Because, you know, I'm to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, and soul. That's called the Shema. That's out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And all the Israelites knew that. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they had it in the phylacteries and in the headbands and on the door facing when they kissed the door. You all know that of the ancient Jewish history. That verse that the man's quoting back to Jesus is who Israel is. And then he said, and also, of course, to love my neighbor as myself, he quotes out of Leviticus. And Jesus makes it clear, yes, that's, that's the way to heaven. That's, that's the kind of heart God wants, you see. But the question in this passage, don't miss it now. The question in this passage is, who is my neighbor? Because so many, not all of them, but so many of the Jewish people of Jesus' day, the neighbor was a fellow Jew. Not a Samaritan, not a Greek, not somebody that doesn't look like you or act like you or not in your culture. And Jesus makes it so clear in this passage, we're to love everybody, to care for everybody, that God is no respecter of persons. Can you say amen? Care for one another. Care for one another. Oh, this is the commandment of God. This is what he's laid on my heart to tell you this week. You are called to be a good Samaritan. And you are called to pray tomorrow morning. Lord, who can I be a good Samaritan to? Years ago, we did an evangelism thrust. I'm going to lift it up to our committee tonight. But this was years ago. 
And it came out of the Methodist tradition called friendship. Fran, F-R-A-N, friendship evangelism. And I loved it. The idea was it was an acronym, F-R-A-N, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Those four areas we were to focus on and to see how we might build the kingdom of God in their lives. So I'm asking you to make a commitment today, right now, and this week from this passage of Scripture. I believe that wherever we go to a local church, I think local churches is where God is. Doesn't matter what the name of it is, whether it's Baptist or Method. Well, maybe not Baptist, but Method. No, I just can't. <laughs> Doesn't matter what name it is. If they love the Lord, they follow the Bible. You know, I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to be connected in a local church. You know, I know we follow the TV preachers, the computer preachers, radio preachers, and and ministries all around the world. I think they're all. Many of them are just super fantastic. But I think to hear what God wants you to do, I think we all need a local connection because we're in local communities. And I think that God is saying to you and to me this week, who can I be a good Samaritan to? Brother Don Holsippel, many of you know him, uh, has been given a book out about called Prayer Evangelism. And it's the idea, this is the way it's stated in the book, who can I pray peace on this week? We are to have feet that are shod with the gospel of peace, the uh, full armor of God. Who can I pray peace on, even if it's my enemy? Remember, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Who in my world is God calling me to be a good Samaritan to? Who? The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 22, Be ye doers of the word and not just hearers. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. The doing comes from a heart that is radically changed. And reading Mr. John Wesley before his was radically changed is so moving to me. The idea that I'm just taking myself right back into his conscience as he's saying, I know what's in front of me. I don't know what else I must do. I keep praying. And I'm thinking, I know the rest of your story. You're going to experience God and you're going to change the world because God's going to change you. God wants to change us. I think one of the greatest stories in the Bible of of investing in someone is the story of Barnabas and John Mark. I've used that analogy before. You remember Barnabas, his name means encourager. He's the one that encouraged the disciples, the original 12, to accept the apostle Paul. They were afraid of him because he was terrible. You remember the history there. But he convinces them and they pray together, they work together, and they are sold out in the apostle Paul. But in their missionary journeys, Paul and Barnabas, they come to a disagreement on John Mark. John Mark, he was a young lad. He went with them on their first missionary journey, and I don't know what happened. Something he wanted to go home. I don't know. Maybe they didn't have fried chicken. I don't know what it was, but there was some major reason he needed to go home. And so he leaves them, and in that day and age, that, that, was, that was bad. That was bad. But he's young. He's young. You know, we have to look at our young people sometimes. They're not old like we are. Somebody say Amen. Now, maybe they should know better, but, but give them a couple more years and maybe they won't be so wet behind the ears. We have to have a little patience with our young people. They're the ones that are going to be running the church here eventually, so we've got to be a little more patient there. And, and Paul was not. He thought the kingdom of God's coming right now. I don't have time to be patient, you know. And I'm saying that because on the second missionary journey, if you remember the story, Barnabas and John Mark are ready to go again. And Paul said, we're not taking that young boy. We're not taking him with us. Now, he's probably 20 years old. He said, you saw what happened last time. And Barnabas, the encourager, the Barnabas, the one that's nice to everybody, Barnabas is saying, Paul, he's, he, you know, he just, he's grown up a lot in the last year. He's ready to go again. He's not going to abandon us this time. And he's, he's so filled. You've heard him preach. You've heard him sing. You've heard him teach. We need him. No, we don't need him. We don't need, we don't need to put ourselves. And it says that the struggle between Paul and Barnabas was so great. These are two men that love God, love Jesus with all their heart. Do you love Jesus with all your heart? Do you know that doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with somebody else that loves Jesus with all their heart? Do you know that just because you love Jesus that your opinion is not going to be the same opinion as somebody else that loves Jesus? And Paul and Barnabas stand toe-to-toe with each other. And what happens? They slug it out? No. They go separate ways building the kingdom. They divide. What a word, prophetic word. For the United Methodist Church. Hear that now. They love the Lord. They both love the Lord. But they know that they cannot be in the same house. And so Paul takes a new disciple, Timothy. Powerful man of God. Or, and just changes the world. 
you know. Uh, Silas, I said Timothy, Silas. And Barnabas takes Mark. Now, if Barnabas had not invested in John Mark, I'm not sure what would have happened. Do you know the gospel of Mark is written by John Mark? It'd be, it wouldn't be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It'd be Matthew, Luke, and John. I mean, it, Paul, just before he was martyred, guess who's there right with him? John Mark. John Mark. I'm assuming Barnabas had already died. They were all older, but John Mark was young. Who's standing with Paul? And he's so thankful that he has a few of his, his cohorts with him, so he's not dying alone for his faith. Who's with him? John Mark. All because somebody by the name of Barnabas invested himself. Who is God calling you to invest yourself in this week? There'll be a different message next week. Hear the word of the Lord. But this week, this week, there's somebody going to come your way. Don't miss them. Don't miss them. You are to be the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. Bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to the moment of commitment. I'm making the commitment. I hope everyone in this room is right now. Lord, number one, send somebody my way. Don't want you to pray, Lord, if anybody comes. Don't want you to pray that way. I want you to pray this way. Lord, send somebody my way. Somebody that I can be their good Samaritan. Whether it's a friend, a relative, associate, or a neighbor. Now remember, neighbor in this parable can be anybody that has a need. Can be even an enemy that has a need. Make your commitment. God has got something just for you this week. Just for me this week. Lord, send somebody my way and don't let me miss them. Don't let me be so busy that I miss them. And Lord, if somehow in my craziness, because I know me, you know you, if I do miss them, bring them back around. Bring them back around. Like I drove around to come back to see Mr. McKay. Bring me, bring me back around and let me try again. And I know you love me so much. You're not going to be upset when you say, Eddie, you blew it, you big dummy. You're not going to do that. And if I sincerely say, oh, Lord, I think I missed it. Take me back around. Then take me back around, Lord. I know you will. That's the kind of God we have. Church, I challenge you. Be the good Samaritan. Build the kingdom in everything you do. And may all of God's people say, amen. amen.